Repeat, all mining ships. Abort Masrium or pickup. Repeat, abort Masrium or pickup. The Citadel has come alive. It's attacked the mines. Our satellite picked up this message. Our defense begins. The shall no longer be affected by those whose flesh That thing seems to be biomechanical. It's, it's made an energy web that can go into new space. The moons are surrounded. Rescue ships can't get through. Everyone is dying. Mazarin, not leave Iosha's moons. The bleeding flesh that enters our citadel will be killed and thrown into tissue vats for reuse. Gar has spoken. That's the latest message from the Citadel. Stay away. The energy web is coming right toward our location. Please, please do not approach Iosha. It's a party. Hello everyone, Alex the Rat here, and today I want to talk about one of the first FPS games I played. And now, I don't mean like that time I accidentally booted up Wolfenstein 3D and my dad came in and promptly turned the game off, despite me being too young and stupid to even know how to play it. I'm talking about the first FPS game that I actually sat down and played, but let's start off with some context. In the 90s, Accolade was mostly known for three things. Racing games, Sports games and Bubsy. Look, I'm not gonna claim Bubsy was the worst thing ever, but the only standout thing about it was that it talked exclusively in annoying cat puns, collected balls of yarn, and was somehow able to glide in the air while also taking fall damage in a genre where fall damage really doesn't belong. Then Bubsy 3D happened. Accolade had a 3D engine on their hands and it quickly, QUICKLY became apparent that Bubsy wasn't going to be doing this whole 3D thing for them. Oh look! An arrow! Aren't these game designers wonderful? Giving so needless to say, Accolade wasn't known for making high quality games. Which makes Eradicator a big outlier in that regard. If you told me that the people who gave us freaking Bubsy 3D made one of the most underrated first person shooters of the 90s, I'd call you insane. But with Boomer Shooters being all the rage again, I feel it's time to shine a light on Accolade's swan song of a game. Eradicator was ambitious, running on a custom engine with its own level editor, free playable characters, and its own lore and universe. It wasn't a parody game like Duke 3D, Blood, or Shadow Warrior. This was on par with Quake or Doom, a straight-up classic kill em all game where all your friends are dead and turn against you, or you're a total bamf who has one mission, kicking some freaking ass. I grew up with this game, and all my life it's been weird to me how nobody really talks about it. So let's do that today. Let's finally talk about Eradicator. <laughs> Looks like I'll be adding the cost of a new ship to my price tag. Eradicator's premise is pretty simple. 
A resource called Masrium is being seized by an ancient alien force emanating from the Citadel. Masrium has so far been mined on the moons of Iosha, which now has become complete death zones where all the miners are being turned into horrific biomechanical beings as their tissue is reformed. Obviously going to Iosha is a horrible idea, so here we are. <laughs> You can play as three different characters, all with their own backstory and stats that are divided into three categories. Movement speed, attack strength, and defense. Each also have their own custom weapon. Whoa, the mine got hit by some kind of energy wave. Dan Blaze is a mining engineer who is augmented with cyberware. And the first objective for all of the characters is to get to the surface of Iosha, so you can disable the iron web generator. Dan is the most balanced character with average stats all around, and from what I remember, was the only one you could play in the shareware demo of the game. He starts out with a strident laser weapon. No idea what a strident is, but it hits stuff. He also has a melee attachment on his gun that he uses. The clan of Tradan shall be made proud today. Kamchak is a reptile and a warrior who is mostly a tanky character who starts out with a photon bolt weapon. Similar to Dan's laser, Kamchak has the highest attack strength of the characters and above average defense, but lacks in speed. As for melee weapon, he just punches things. Elena Brinstarl is a literal cat girl, so I guess she counts as a furry. <laughs> Her melee weapon are a pair of claws that I swear she stole from Wolverine, and her starting gun is the Ripper disc. But I need the disc from a real tournament by several years, though it's not as destructive. Being a mercenary, she's not really in this for glory, she's being paid by the Universal Mining Guild to resolve the whole situation. Aside from an average attack strength, she has the highest movement speed in the game, which makes up for her defense rating, which is the lowest in the game. Now, as obviously sexualized as Selena is, seeing a female protagonist in the first person shooter from 996 is such a dang rarity. Like, name any 90s FPS with a female protagonist. It's really hard to remember one, because Eradicator might have been one of the extremely few to feature one. Since it's pretty much mandatory for me to play a female in any game that has the option to, she ended up being my main character for my playthrough. Marine, use of your radio is forbidden. Maintain radio silence. There's also a fourth character you can unlock by completing the game once. The Alliance Commando is pretty much your generic soldier type, who doesn't really have any interesting backstory. His stats are overall pretty good though, with the second highest move speed in the game, the highest attack strength, but an average defense rating. Looking at Eradicator, you'll be forgiven for mistaking it for a build engine game. I've done it, others have done it, and every time it's kind of a shock that it's using a custom engine. I mean, look at it, you've got a fake 3D view where looking up and down kind of looks a bit weird. You have explosions everywhere and a very interactive environment. As well as a freaking smorgasbord of weapons, all 15 of them, and a whole bunch of inventory items. So just purely in terms of technology, Eradicary is like a knockoff build engine game, which I definitely think was intentional. I mean, Accolade obviously wanted to make something that can compete with Doom, Duke 3D, Shadow Warrior, and Blood. Though, Eradicator lacks the same kind of recognizable environments and doesn't rely on pop culture references, making it have more in common with something like Doom or Quake. It ends up feeling very alien and the levels often don't make a lot of realistic sense and are more abstract. But let's get this thing started and do this on... Yeah, let's do the highest difficulty, why not? Unlike other FPSs from the 90s, the difficulty for the most part is fair. As long as you're smart about how you play and utilize the items and weapons at your disposal, the hardest difficulty is honestly kind of a cakewalk compared to something like Blood or Shadow Warrior. I also want to mention that unlike a lot of FPS tiles from the time, it does have in-game tutorials. If you play on easy, you get these question mark boxes that give you tutorial messages, which definitely helps with how objective-based the gameplay is. So what sets the Radicator apart? Well, it Definitely wasn't common to see FPSs of the time require anything from the player beyond collecting keycards, pushing switches, and maybe solve a switch puzzle. Eradicator instead will have you going around the level completing specific objectives to unlock the exit, making you feel like you're on a mission and not just mindlessly going from level to level. As abstract as the levels get, they do feel like they serve a purpose in the game's universe. Another thing that sets it apart is the weapon variety. 
in addition to the starting weapons, you get freaking 14 additional ones throughout the game. You have the sonic rounds that fire a sonic boom at your enemies, and the dart gun that fires explosive darts. It's a pretty good workhorse weapon, pretty much a stand-in for the minigun from Doom. Then we have the explosives. You got the missile launcher, and the missiles are actually homing, and you can even switch to the missile to control it mid-flight. No other FPS at the time did anything like this. And it more or less makes the missile launcher a sniper weapon, since you can more or less fire a missile from across the map, and it will probably hit what you're aiming at. You have two kinds of grenades to choose from, the death bombs and the smoke bombs. Both do the same thing, except the smoke bombs release uh, smoke, as you may have guessed, that can deal damage to anyone who walks into them. Detonation mines are a lot of fun to use. You can place one down and on its own it'll act like a proximity mine and explode whenever something gets close to it. But similar to the missile launcher, you can switch over to the mine's view and detonate it remotely. It is extremely useful in some cases, since the splash damage can actually hurt enemies behind cover, like in this map, where some enemies were hidden behind a wall, and I could actually kill them before the wall opened. Again, an insanely cool feature for a first-person shooter from 1996. The Arachninator is a walking spider bomb that you can actually control remotely by switching over to it when it's out. You can use them to send into rooms full of enemies without risking alerting them, since they won't react to it. They deal a pretty good chunk of damage too, and with the right placement you can take out like two or three enemies with one Arachninator. I even used one to open this secret door, which had an insanely small timer, making it impossible to reach otherwise. Then there's the... energy whip? No, that's not an energy whip. That weapon in Johnny Mnemonic that looked cool as frick, that was an energy whip. And this is a freaking flamethrower. And honestly the worst weapon in the game because it has piss poor range and deals barely any damage. Which combined with the fact it's extremely close range makes it usually not worth the risk. It's only useful if you have no other ammunition to use, and against some enemies it can work, like these green bastards that run at you. Otherwise, I usually don't bother with it. Boomerangs will usually return to you if you don't actually hit anything, but most of the time they disappear when hitting an enemy. They don't do a lot of damage and you don't get a lot of them, so they don't feel that viable to use most of the time. A cool concept, but they feel superfluous. The evil little buddy is a flying sphere that when launched will attach itself to anything nearby and eventually explode, and that includes you. You can pick up a health sphere to get it to buzz off though. While it's fairly useful against flying enemies, it does take a bit before it deals damage, which means you also have to be careful about the enemies getting close to you before it detonates. The hover drone is basically a flying arachninator, so imagine a missile that you can actually control to a higher degree. This is a fair amount of damage too, but ammunition is fairly rare and you don't really get a lot of it until later in the game. The missile hunter killer is a really, really good weapon. It's basically a floating turret that fires missiles at nearby enemies. It unfortunately never lasts that long and you can only carry a maximum of 4 of them, so use them sparingly. In the right situation, though, they can be invaluable. Oh, what's happening? Finally, you have the Death Sphere, the game's ultimate weapon. This sphere, when launched, will insta-kill anything it touches and will seek out enemy after enemy, making it capable of clearing an entire room by itself. Ammunition is extremely scarce, as you can imagine, and you can only carry one at a time, so use them sparingly as well. There's also a fair amount of inventory items you can use, and unlike a lot of build engine games, they do actually stack, so you can carry more than one of them and activate them at will. The Adrenaline Catalyst is pretty much exactly the steroid power-up from Duke 3D. It makes you go a lot faster, so using it on Alina, who has the highest movement speed in the game, is... well, see for yourself. Low-grab boots are kinda like the high jumpers from the Metroid series. They give you additional jump height and allow you to get to higher places that might otherwise be inaccessible. Very useful for finding secret areas. It's kind of interesting how this kind of power up wouldn't really be utilized again until Iron Fury did in 2019. Xenomist Invisibility makes you invisible, kind of like the invisibility sphere from Doom, except it has an actual transparency effect. 
Largely, I kind of use this power up since, for the most part, you're better off just killing everything instead. The Retina Enhancer is more or less night vision goggles from Duke 3D, though I kind of like the name better since they don't provide night vision as much as they just highlight enemies for you. The Force Wall Defense Measure puts up a wall in front of you. It can be used to block shots from enemies or you can use it to climb onto in order to reach higher places. The Rainbow Defense Measure is a small ground turret that fires bullets similar to a water sprayer and is kind of useless most of the time. The Soul Capture, though, is definitely the most interesting item in the game. You may have noticed there's no med kit option, which a lot of other FPSs at the time had. That's because Soul Capture lets you feed off the souls of your fallen enemies. Use it near a corpse and it will actually consume the corpse's soul. And yeah, I've tested it on turrets and it works, which has some rather horrifying implications. There are also some instant use items you can pick up. There's an invincibility power-up that makes you invulnerable for a limited time. There's also little buddies, which are small floating drones that provide you with additional firepower, as well as the big buddy, which does the same but with better ammo and more durability. The buddies will tank damage for you, including if you land in hazardous liquids. You can also find health pickups, with the yellow ones providing a partial health boost and the red ones refilling your entire health bar. As you can imagine, in classic boomer shooter fashion, the game is full of secrets. The game has three areas you must traverse in order to reach the core, each with its own bonus level. To get to the bonus level, you must collect special key cards that in most cases are well hidden. Miss any of them though, and you won't be able to access the bonus level. Secret hunting is made easier when you find the automap power up or geographical survey, as it's called. This will reveal all hidden areas on your automap, similar to the computer map power up from Doom. Not all levels have these though, so a lot of the time you have to just keep an eye open for a misaligned texture, light differences, or other hints. For the most part, secrets are easy to find in Eradicator if you're used to it from build engine titles, for instance. Most of the enemies in Eradicator are biomechanical drones. There are flying ones that use a flamethrower and ones on wheels that fire lasers at you. Later on, you'll be facing upgraded versions of these that shoot grenades and missiles at you, dealing a pretty big chunk of damage. The worst enemies are the ones that fly at you and explode though, these litter a large chunk of the levels, and as soon as you hear their noise, you're gonna be clapping your butt cheeks tired than Alina's butt. I hate these flying assholes so dang much, especially these flying eyeballs that explode when they fly at you and can pretty much kill you in one hit if you're unlucky. You also have these water-based assholes that duck back under water when you shoot them. Kind of annoying, so for the most part I just shoot them with explosives to get rid of them as soon as possible. Later on you also face this trooper who I swear sounds like Lo Wang when they discover you. They fire the same kind of darts that you use at you and can be a bit of a pain. But they're still pretty easy compared to some of the other enemies. In the biolab levels, you also have these green goblins who just run at you and try to maul you, but they're pretty easy to deal with using the flamethrower. There's also bosses, of course, with the game only having three of them, though they all provide a decent enough challenge. The first boss is kind of a pushover, though. You just run around the area, make sure to avoid his destination mines, and just fire missiles at him until he dies. My, what a big machine you weren't. The second boss is a bit trickier, though. You start in this big room with deadly biohazard waste on the bottom that you have to avoid. Learn the hard way that you instantly have to get out of the room to this outer ring outside that's full of ammo and bad guys to kill. These powerful drones show up later as the regular enemies as well. Once you've killed all of them and gathered some ammo, you can just fire away at him from an advantageous position until he dies. Just as well. He would have been a crummy date. The third and final boss is Gore, who you saw at the start of the game. A flying biomechanical skeleton who takes a huge amount of damage to kill. If you have a death sphere or other really powerful weapons, use them to take out as much health as you can before you begin fighting him proper, and just avoid these attacks while getting to the higher levels to grab some supplies. You won't need them after the fight anyway, so make sure to get as much as you can just to kill him with. For the most part, each level will have a set of objectives for you to complete. 
You may have to use a computer console to control a droid so you can advance. You may have to solve a time puzzle, disable force fields, or you may have to blow something up. At any time you can press tab to bring up the auto map, which will show you the current level stats and objectives as well. I really enjoy old FPS's that show you the level stats like this, uh, it kinda helps my OCD. <laughs> what sets the Radical apart is that there's no key hunting involved, so it feels a lot more varied and less repetitive than most other FPS tells of its time. The levels are also fairly open-ended, allowing you to approach the objectives how you want. Additionally, all the three areas of the game feel substantially different from each other. It's kind of funny how Eradicator was doing the more objective-based levels in 996 when it didn't really become commonplace until games like Quake 2 made it more common. And a lot of the time, Quake 2 is given more credit for it when Eradicator should definitely be given some credit for being one of the earliest games to do it. Now, for all the praise I'm giving this game, I do have a few things I don't like about it. For one, there's no crouch key, which can be a bit of a pain. The aiming also feels kind of stiff, and with the 2D nature of the game engine, aiming up and down feels as clunky as you'd expect it to, uh, similar to the build engine. I also noticed that whenever you start a new level, the speed lock is enabled, meaning every time you go to a new level you have to toggle it if you want to be able to walk. This is because the shift key doesn't change your speed, it just makes you run. So if you're already running, it literally does nothing. And since I like being able to walk, that's a bit of an issue. <laughs> That being said, a good thing about the game is that you can bind the mouse keys to any function in the game, so playing with a mouse feels really good. There is also a multiplayer mode where you can play the entire game cooperatively or uh, play death matches. I wasn't able to capture any footage for this review of the multiplayer mode, mostly because uh, I'm on a tight time limit, but it's there if you want to play it. I really can't think of anything else that's really wrong about the game, so let's move on to the graphics. Graphically, the game looks very much off its time. What makes it kinda impressive though is that you can have level geometry above other level geometry, and stuff like flying platforms that can even fly below and above level geometry. Sometimes the game engine doesn't quite know how to process it, but it's definitely very cool. The texture work is also solid, with great use of lighting to create an atmosphere. I also love the fact that you can switch between first and third person at any time, which helps a lot with a lot of the platforming you have to do in the game. Usually I think platforming in first person shooters is just painful, such as in Shadow Warrior, but allowing the player to use third person view helps a lot with judging where your character is in a three dimensional space. The game even has an auto POV option that changes the point of view depending on where you're standing, so if the camera is placed close enough to the player, you'll automatically go into first person. Of course, a huge reason this game might not have caught on was the fact Quake released around the same time. And compared to Quake, Eradicator looks kinda dated. But in my opinion, even with Eradicator using a more dated engine, the atmosphere is definitely on par with Quake. A lot of that atmosphere is also thanks to the music. And unlike Vanilla Quake, you can actually listen to it without the game CD. It's just that the CD music is higher quality and has more variation generally. It's very similar to Quake's soundtrack, as most of it's ambience and background noise, providing more of an atmosphere than catchy beats. The soundtrack helps add a grungy sci-fi vibe to the game as well. Rick Kelly is the guy who was responsible for the sound, and you can tell he put a lot of effort into it. Everything sounds very cyber horror, with a mix of mechanical and electronic noises and organic voices that give off an eerie vibe. Combined with his soundtrack, Eradicator has this dark sci-fi vibe to it that I really enjoy. The voice acting isn't great and kind of cheesy most of the time, but enjoyable so. This sludge looks pretty nasty. At least the voice actor for Alina is pretty enjoyable. I didn't really get to listen to the others much. Dan Blaze's voice actor sounds like a budget Michael Bean, to be honest, and that's already a plus. Whoa, the mine got hit by some kind of energy wave. So I've already talked about my first video game, 
Duke Nukem. Well, Eradicator was probably one of the first FPS games I played. Ever since I was a child, I've been fascinated with the game, and finally sitting down to own, not only play it, but be on the highest difficulty feels surreal. I've finally beaten the game that got me into first-person shooters, and what else can I say? This game is extremely underrated, and I really think it's a shame it never got the recognition it deserved. It obviously became overshadowed by not just Quake, but also Duke Nukem 3D and Blood and other build engine games, but Eradicator still stands on its own with its quirky weapons, inventory items, and not to mention objective best gameplay that keeps each level somewhat interesting. It's also fairly challenging without being too difficult on the hardest difficulty. So grab yourself a copy on Steam or GOG, pick your character and have a blast with this forgotten 90s beer machine. It deserves it. It's also kind of disappointing that there's still no source port of the game. The only way to play Eradicator is in DOS. And let's be real, having the game being stuck at 320 by 200 resolution for the foreseeable future is kind of depressing. I think this game could seriously do with a remaster, to enhance the atmosphere even further with some dynamic lighting and stuff. With all the boomer shooter remasters and source ports out there, it's a shame that the Radicator has been left out in the dust. Unfortunately, that's probably due to the fact it runs on a custom engine. As far as I know, the source code has never been made public. That being said, Eradicator plays surprisingly well for a game from 996. With some rebinding, you can use a fairly modern control scheme with this game, as like a lot of build engine games. It supports WASD and mouse controls, and running the game in DOSBox is no problem at all, just set the cycles to max and that's literally all you need. Unfortunately in Linux, the game ships with an older DOSBox version that for some reason doesn't capture the mouse correctly. So if you're on newer versions of Linux, at least Ubuntu or Linux Mint, you'll have to replace the DOSBox files with ones from a newer version, and that should fix the problem. I also noticed with DOSBox that it for some reason struggles with the screen transitions, something it didn't used to do, so that's a bit concerning. It's not a problem with other releases of DOSBox, like DOSBox X, so you might have better luck running the game in those. But that's all I had to say about Eradicator. Let me know what you think about the game in the comments, and I'll see you later. Take care.